Hi, I'm Charity Bailey. Welcome to season two of Girl We Need to Talk. For those of you just joining us, I started this show as a passion project as I was mourning my dad. And after I lost him, I was grieving really heavy and just needed an outlet and this became that. During season one, we featured so many of my friends who helped me along the way. And they've also lost parents and have their own stories of grief, love, life, and loss. Well, this season, we're grateful to hear stories from several very different women who will share how they're growing in their grief, what it looks like to find that silver lining during and after a storm. All of the women featured this season have faced their own extremely tough battles from child loss, postpartum depression, fibroids, and the death of a spouse. And while all of their experiences are so different, what they do have in common is their resilience, transparency, and vulnerability. Simply put, the women that you're going to meet during season two of Girl We Need to Talk, well, they're warriors. Now, before we get into their stories, this first episode is dedicated to healing. And we're gonna talk about how we can begin to do that. Girl We Need to Talk season two starts right now. My father died on June 20th, 2018. I was 37 years old and suddenly everything I knew about myself was uprooted. I had so many questions and there were so many layers to peel back. Who am I? What do I want in life? What will my legacy be? Why? Why am I so angry? Why do I shut down? Why do I explode? Why do I overeat? Why do I attract certain people, certain men, and why do I date these men? Why am I wired this way? Who was my daddy? The man, the father, the husband, and son. Who am I because of him? Why do I feel the need to fight and why do I pride myself on the fight? I had so many questions. See, I've always been a daddy's girl, a guy's girl, and the homie. But in this season, it was the women in my life who carried me. My mantra for 2019 was happy, healthy, whole. I was determined to face my grief and heal. I went to therapy, tried acupuncture, hit the gym, and spent a lot of time with God in worship. My girls were there with me every step of the way. I found strength and vulnerability. We had open, honest, transparent conversations, and that's what we'll do here in this space. So grab your journal, light some candles, pour a glass of wine and get cozy because girl, we need to talk. My first guest is Aurelia Anderson Thompson. She is a licensed counselor and therapist, an author, coach, consultant, and she specializes in grief therapy and women's ministries. Well, she also happens to be my cousin and a really dear friend, and she has an incredible story. Aurelia, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Anything for you. And you know that. <laughs> Absolutely anything. Yeah. Well, you have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, a lot of it you did in school and a lot of it you did in life. So the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of all things reproductive. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we can look, kind of laugh about it now, but it, you've been yeah. through some very painful experiences. This season, we are discussing pregnancy loss, postpartum depression, fibroids, the loss of a spouse, and financial failures. You've been through all of that. And then you add to that list a hysterectomy, and you're only 40. So tell us a little bit about your story and how that has impacted your passion and your purpose. Well, you know, starting at, with the last part of how it's impacted my passion and my purpose, I've been all things women by default. Like I didn't seek out to be in women's ministry, but I was a women's pastor after youth ministry and not knowing that I would be all things reproductive. It's just, it's wild and bananas. And, but I believe that it was, it was ordained. It was called. And so I'm not saying that my tragedy was necessarily ordained, but all of those things that I went through, allowed me to really be able to touch the lives of the women in, that I minister to, that I counsel. And so for me, my first pregnancy, I talk about how it was just, it was flawless physically. It was physically flawless. Um, the 40 weeks, you know, the morning sickness came and went. I had all the energy. It was, it was amazing. It was great. But then afterwards, I had, I experienced postpartum depression. Um, and I really attribute, attribute it to the situation that was occurring in my then marriage. And then, and then a subsequent miscarriage. Um, and then we ended up having to terminate what some people would consider an abortion. 
for this particular situation is called a DNC. It's where you have to terminate the pregnancy either surgically, um, medically with, you know, with a pill. And so, but I won't go into all that, but, you know, had to go through that experience and then the loss of the spouse um, eventually through divorce um, for the financial failures that came as a result of the divorce. And so fast forward 10 years, I'm pregnant with the now, you know, vibrant baby girl, but her pregnancy was, was nothing vibrant and exciting at all. And it, come find out it was, I had fibroids. I had multiple fibroids. They were ginormous. Yeah. I remember Um, when you told me about having to share your uterus with the fibroids and you're a small woman also. So my, my, the, the OBGYN said that my uterus at two months was like a four month pregnancy. Four Mm. months was like six and seven months. Well, we know what six and seven months is taking you. It's almost to your term, right? Eight, nine, 10. Um, and so my body, it was playing tricks. And so come 20 weeks, I'm in this, I'm in excruciating pain, excruciating pain. We go to the emergency room after day three. I'm, I'm having, um, contractions. They're thinking I'm about to be in labor. So they have to, you know, give me medication to try to stop, you know, the contractions, but they called in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. They called the NICU team in just in case little baby girl was born at 20 weeks. Yeah. Like I was not expecting that. And so then I knew, I said, you know, I didn't know I had fibroids, um, but I said, we're not, we're not doing this. And so October, I had her in January. We had to, we took her early. Um, because I was in the hospital 35 weeks on narcotics and opioids and they didn't want her on there for four more weeks. She would have, she would have been addicted. Right. So we induced, we had her. And then that was January, October. I had my, um, hysterectomy, partial hysterectomy. Um, and so it was, it's a whirlwind. When I think back to from, I'm 40 now. It's, this all started 25. My, my reproductive journey started about 25. Um, 15 years. Yeah. So what, what impact has that had on you mentally, emotionally? We know what it's done physically. You ended up having to have a hysterectomy. But the other impacts, how has that been for you? You know, I, di- I never thought about it. I never really thought about it going through it. It's, but it's in those moments of reflection at the time, you know, I'm just, we just go through, we just go through it, handle it. The black woman schema, right? Some people mm-hmm. call it the, the strong black woman syndrome. Child, I ain't strong no more. I'm done being strong. It's the- <laughs> <laughs> you come save me. I'm done. You know, I, I mean, really, it's the strong black woman schema. That's what they call it. It's when, it's that stereotype of black women having to be strong and resilient caregivers, which is good for us. That's a, it's called a protective factor. We're able to handle the intensity, but what it does on the flip side, it keeps us from seeking help. It keeps us from being honest with our emotions and who we are. And so for me, emotionally, kind of going through it, I'm like, okay, well, I go through, I learn something new. But then it's in those quiet moments that mm-hmm. I reflected. And then I became in touch with my emotions and feelings. And then that's when the depressive moments came. In. That's when the anxious moments came in. Because we're looking at you on this side of the tracks, on this side of the grief and the pain. Right. And you're very resilient. Uh, healing and growth, right? It's a thing, it's very trendy right now and people are talking about it and hashtagging it, but how do we actually begin to do the work so that we can step into this place of peace? How do we have the tough conversations and why is growth so challenging in the first place? Do you see this plant back here? Yeah. So this is, this is, what's the name of, what's the name of this plant? Succulent. Child, it's a succulent, it's a, okay. It's a succulent. It's supposed to be one of the easiest plants to take care of outside of a cactus. It's withered, 
because it hasn't been taken care of. It hasn't been taken care of. You know why? Because I don't know how. Mm. I didn't know how to take care of it. We don't, we don't talk about mental wellness. We talk about physical wellness. We don't talk mm. about mental wellness. And it's not until we have prominent figures um, in the public who struggle with it or sometimes unfortunately succumb to their, mm-hmm. their, their challenges that we as a larger culture begin to talk about it. And so for me, I think talking about it, everyone telling your story of how you are anxious, how you are um, traumatized, been traumatized, talk about how you have your low moods, your depression, talk about it, talk about it making it normal yeah making it a part of the human body and the human experience that's where we start is by having the conversation putting it out there in the public letting people know that it's okay if someone says hey how you doing today and we're passing by on the street i'm like okay good as i'm passing by the street but if i'm sitting down answer it's the easy answer But if you, but but for you, I'm sitting down with you. And then if you say, and we're just sitting down, we're actually in each other's presence, phone, mm -hmm. whatever. And you say, how you been? Tell the truth. Yeah, but that's the thing though. Everybody's not ready to accept the truth, which is how we arrived at how's your heart instead of how are you doing? Because it gets a different response, right? And also a lot of times we just asking how you doing in passing. We're not really like, girl, how are you doing? You know? And so is it okay though? Is it okay? I no. asked the client, I asked the client, it's, it's not. I asked the client literally today, she was explaining some things to me and I said, can you, is it okay for you to do that? Mm. Like, do you have permission to feel that way? She said, no. Huh. So we have to give ourselves permission to even start the growth and healing process. You talked about storytelling and tell, well, telling your story, uh, but often with your clients, you find it important that they do express themselves and use storytelling as a method. And it's a model called narrative therapy. Can you explain that for me? Yes, and so narrative therapy, it works very well with persons who've experienced trauma, and children and so what narrative therapy does is it allows for a person to find their voice Mm -hmm. they're telling their story they're telling what has happened to them throughout their life as a story as if it's their characters in a story what it does is it externalizes the situation it removes them from the situation and they're an outsider looking in and so the work that we do is we help them find their voice by telling the story, telling what happened. And then we're able to look at the themes. Where do you see, what's thematic about this thing? Like a, like a traditional story that, you know, where are the themes? Where are the important characters? Where's the plot? Where's the climax? We look at it to help them reframe and to see it differently. Mm. Help them see, see their story differently from what they've been telling themselves, what others have been telling them, how they should view their story. We're giving you your voice back. And with that, then that's a, that's a framework or foundation for how we can help their healing. Finding your voice as a woman is a hard thing. My friends and I used to talk about it when we were in our twenties. And once you find it, child, ain't no putting it back. You just be like, (laughs) I'm going to tell it like it T.I. is. (laughs) Yes. But we do, <laughs> listen, it is what it is. You're just like, all right, whoever don't want to hear it, that's on you. Um, but you've been through a lot of traumatic things. You still find purpose in your story. Mm. You share your story so openly. So how do you use your story to help connect to your clients and in turn help them tell their stories to become triumphant and to live a life full of purpose as well? Well, you know, from my my spiritual background, um, as a Christian, you know, I use sacred text of the Bible. And so there is a scripture where there's, where it's talking about Christ and Christ being crucified and the blood of the lamb. We are overcome by the blood of the lamb mm-hmm. and in the power of that testimony of overcoming. So 
believer, non-believer, religious person, non- non-religious person, you can extrapolate that and say, by telling you what I overcame, what I had to struggle with, what I had to go through, by you tell, by me telling you what I did, what that does is it fuels my fire to mm-hmm. see what I've come through. And I'm like, oh, it's yeah. called efficacy, self-efficacy. What I've done in the past, I can do again. And then yeah. what that does is it gives the next person hope. Well, if, if she can do it, if he can do it, I can do it too. Why can I do it too? Because I'm a human being as well. And there's no respecter of persons. There's no hierarchy in this thing. We all breathe the same thing. We all have the same blood. So yeah. if it can happen for you, it can happen for me. And so when I look at myself as a clinician, when I look at myself as a therapist, when I look at myself as a grief counselor, when I look at myself as a minister, I remind myself with my story that I am wounded just like the people that I serve. Henry um, Wynn, he talks about in The Wounded Healer that it is only in our woundedness that we can really effectively help somebody else. Yeah. Because it reminds us of our humanity. So it brings us down a notch, right? You asked the question, you said, how do you tell your story to, your, to those who you help? Very carefully. So in, okay. our, in, the, in the work that we do, it's called counter-transference. And so knowing that someone who we sit across from, at a client, and we're helping them, and, and they begin to share something that we identify with, and something kind of comes up for us. I know Miss J, when we be talking about me, and she'll be like, okay, counter-transference is happening now. I don't like him. I'm talking to you like your mama, auntie, grandmama. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> okay. I don't like this one bit, and this has nothing to do with you. I'm like, oh, girl, okay. <laughs> I mean, seriously, okay, so. It's a thing, yeah. I mean, it is, and so I have to check myself. So knowing that in my woundedness, in the areas that the healing has not finished, mm. I have to remind myself in the moment with the client, I have to remind myself, this is, this is their session. Not about you. Not about you. This is their session. Identify, move on. So, so very carefully, but it allows me, it allows me to show up with heart. Well, the goal of this show is to provide a space where we can have you know, transparent conversations, a space where we can be vulnerable and encourage growth, not only from ourselves, but the folks around us and other women. And you were talking about grief and you are a grief counselor. Um, Let's talk about J.W. Warden's four task of mourning. What is that about? Yeah, so most people, well, let me not say most people, a lot of people are familiar with the five stages of grief. That- We know that 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 is, rip it up and toss it out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Why the toss out? Let's see if you listen, paying attention. So we we love and we appreciate Elizabeth Kubler Ross for getting the conversation in pop culture, getting it started. Right? She laid a lot of the foundation and framework. So we give honor where honor is due. What Jay Warden and a lot of other um, psychologists and social workers have done is that they've expanded on that. And so what Warden does is he lets us know in a very non-linear fashion that we are seeking to accomplish tasks. There's four tasks that we seek to accomplish. And it's this process of mourning and it's to help us reestablish like our balance and equilibrium, get us back to baseline before the death. And so the first task is to accept the reality of the loss. Um, Mm. So it's called denial for Kubler-Ross, but it's to accept the reality of the loss, not just the just loss. Get real with it, okay? Like it, like the reality of what you lost. Mm-hmm. Like, and I and I, I expand on that when I talk to my clients is we're not just accepting the loss. Like you can cremate, bury the person, and you know that they are dead. But what does the reality of that loss mean? Mm. I'm alone. That now. hits. Yeah, that hits right here. Cause Miss J asked me that question once. And I was like, it's the expectation of reconciliation with my dad. 
right? Like, because yeah. clearly, if you think about it, we lost six years with him because we weren't on speaking terms. He didn't want to talk. Yeah. So it's he already wasn't here in theory, right? But now the expectation of reconciliation and the wait, one day I might call and he picks up the phone. It's all gone. It's all like rip it up, right. throw it out the window next. So now you're grieving the loss of what could have been. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. that that's that first task. Accept the reality of the loss in all its layers. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's task one. Task two is processing the pain of grief. So grief has a lot of physical pain. It has mm -hmm. emotional pain. It has financial pain. There are, there are, there's pain. It's a relational pain. Mm -hmm. And, and it's problem. crippling. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. It literally sucks the life out of you. And you cannot, for, you can't move. So for some people, you can't move. For some people, you move too much. I mean, there's a pain. And so you have to really just take a moment and to process the pain of grief we don't want it we don't want to because it hurts like no one wants yeah. to experience discomfort but that's yeah. a task in and of itself and then third what you have to do is adjust to this new normal mm -hmm. it's a new normal and so and and that's more um the tangible task the the actual you know what what's my role now who am yes. I now? What what do I do now? What does this look like now? I mean, yeah. how do I do it? That. How do I do it? Such and such yeah. used to do it. How do I do it? You yeah. know, um, and then, you know, the last task most mostly is finding a way to remember them and hold and honor that person in your life mm -hmm. while moving forward with your life. And I really like um, I love ritual. And ritual help really helps helps people. It helps not just children. It helps adults. It helps it helps families um, to be able to remember the person, hold them close while we journey forward. So, when, so you say, mm -hmm. when you say ritual, what do you mean? So ritual, um, a tangible external way to hold space for that person. Yeah. So like so, for me, I have my dad's helmet on the dresser. We go to his grave site for where Nellie and Libby go there often. Nellie takes the girls so they understand that type of thing. The new traditions where we hold space for them. Correct. Yeah. Um, so as we wrap up, let's talk about how we adapt to the challenges of transitioning from girlhood to womanhood, womanhood to wifehood or motherhood. How do we find our place and space in the world with so much going on around us? And actually, how do we not lose ourselves in it? Yeah. So it comes back to know thyself, mm. you know, to thine own self be true. Go back to Shakespeare. To thine own self be true. We can only be true to ourself if we know ourselves. How do we know ourselves? Ask, a, ask yourself, what do I like? Who am I? What do I want? What don't I like? It's literally asking those questions. We do it for other people. When we want to embrace a, a new relationship, we ask them all kinds of questions because we want to get to know them. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself. You can journal. You can talk in the mirror. You, whatever it is. sticky notes. <laughs> I mean, it literally... It literally is knowing yourself, but you don't know yourself if you don't, you know, talk to yourself. Yes, talk to yourself, yeah. but have a conversation. Really be intentional about knowing who you are, even as a 17 year old, as a senior in high school. I wish we did more work in high schools with with girls and guys. But for women, for girls, we go through so many changes. The mm -hmm. female body goes through so many changes throughout our entire life. Menopause, hello, from puberty to menopause. We don't- We can't changing. catch a break, child. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> and so it's important people... to just know, just to know who we are and what we want at our core. So that way, when we change status as a, as a female, as a woman, 
the core of who we are doesn't change. Mm, that's important. And you talk a lot about your experiences uh, in your book there behind you, lip gloss blazers and shoes. One thing about one thing about lip gloss blazers and shoes that it's an easy read. So I tell people it's an easy read, um, but it packs some punches, meaning it wants every woman to know yourself, know who you are, love her, fall in love with yourself, all of you, and then walk forward in purpose. Walk, walk steady, walk sure, and never, never stop. Woo, I think we can end it right there. Go ahead and the doors of the church Listen. are open. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the plate. Yes. <laughs> well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. We started season two. With the bang. And I just appreciate you. You're my friend. You're my cousin. We've done so much life together. Our grandmother would be proud, my friend. Don't make me cry. Way, yeah. I mean, the way you have overcome so much and are now going back in and helping other women to find their passion and to find love of self. And uh, I just love you. Thank I you. Love you. I love you too, girl. Yes. Cheers to season two. Oh, listen. Uh-oh. Wait a minute now. I have, I got my mug too, girl. Hey. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and for those of you who have not started watching The Others yet, we do have a new series uh, starting after episode two, it is, called The After Session. And so Ray is going to be answering some of the questions that come up during the episode uh, so yeah, that'll be a lot of fun too. So we'll see you next time. See you then. <laughs>